Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Serge Lemouton, computer music designer at IRCAM. IRCAM is the Institute for Research and Coordination in Acoustics slash Music, one of the world's largest public research centers dedicated to both musical expression and scientific research. IRCAM is part of the Centre Pompidou in the heart of Paris, France, and is specialized in avant-garde electroacoustic art music. Welcome, Serge. You've been with IRCAM for many years. Would you please introduce yourself to the audience and tell us a little bit about your background? When I was a student, I was interested in music, but also in science and mathematics, and I didn't want to choose one direction or the other. So I try to find uh, an occupation, a job that will uh, conciliate this uh, interest into music and, and science. And uh, I was interested in, in musical creation, contemporary music. My cursus was in uh, composition. So I learned composition in uh, National Conservatory in Lyon with Philippe Manoury, who was already working at IRCAM. And then when I finished my study at uh, the conservatory as a uh, composer and uh, computer music. I arrived at IRCAM and I, I'm still at IRCAM since then. And it's a job that conciliates this interest into music and, and science, so I'm happy. <laughs> You're one of the members of the Working Group on Collaborative Archiving and Creative Preservation of AFIM. AFIM is uh, Association Francophone d'Informatique Musicale. What is the mission of this group? What does it do? In fact, it's a working group, and uh, each two years, uh, the Francophone Association for Computer Music is promoting a research group. So for these two years, we are working and trying to develop systems for better archiving of electroacoustic music. Is this action specifically targeted at the music produced here at IRCAM, or not only IRCAM? Uh, no, in fact, I think we have to go back uh, to uh, IRCAM Repertoire, because IRCAM is an institution that exists since more than 40 years, and we have a lot of creation. Each year we produce around 20 new works uh, in the studios, and so after 40 years, it makes a lot of works. We want to be able to play. It's like our patrimoine. patrimony. It's uh, a repertoire that we want to preserve and to be able to play, so we have this problem because music that uses technology, it needs some elaboration to be re-performed after a few years because of obsolescence and the fact that technology is not uh, something very perenne. Permanent. It's not easy to replay a, a piece that uses technology after a few years, to say it short. And so at IRCAM, we developed some know-how and some techniques and some knowledge to be able to preserve and to re-perform the music that has been created in the past years at IRCAM. And the working group of AFIM is something different because there is the same problem for all the musical creation centers in France and in Europe. So we want to give to the community the know-how, the knowledge we have developed inside IRCAM to preserve our own creations. And we want to give it to the community. So that's the goal of the AFIM working group. What is the relationship between music and technology in the productions that you do? So where does the challenge for preservation lie? It's really uh, related to your subject of techno-culture, because when we think about uh, classical repertoire, about literature, about uh, graphic art, it's quite easy to preserve a, a painting or a book. As soon as we are using some interactive technology or some digital technology or any computer, we need to preserve not only the artifact, but also the way to expose it. And we know in our daily life how a simple software update can break everything on your smartphone, for instance. So, and it's the same for all the musical or artistic works that use technology. So it's true for music, but it's true also for museum installations that use cathodic uh, tubes or old television set. So as, as soon as you are using a technology which is subject to a very quick obsolescence, it brings a lot of problems and it's a kind of acceleration of time. 
So if we need to preserve a, a painting, it's quite easy in a museum. You need to restore it after uh, several centuries. But for a um, work of art produced with a computer, you need to restore it, you need to reprogram it every five years. The lifetime of an interactive computer technology system, it's, it's not more than four or five years. So that's a problem. <laughs> Sometimes in this field where I also work, we tend to say that preserving books and paintings is easy. And I would like to give the devil its due and say that it's not easy in absolute terms at all. But when we deal with interactive systems that rely on computer technology, on digital technology, the lifespan of these systems can be measured in a few years four, five years. So it's definitely a different order of magnitude that we deal with here compared to traditional cultural heritage materials. And you've made this point beautifully. Thank you for that. I think it would be very nice at this point to try and listen to how one of these pieces may sound. It's just an example, of course, but a notable example nonetheless. It's also close to my heart because the composer is Fausto Romitelli. Romitelli comes from my same hometown, Gorizia, in Italy. He was very active and appreciated at IRCAM and abroad. He sadly passed away a few years ago, so this is my way of paying homage to him and to our hometown. The excerpt that we're going to listen to is from Entrance, Entrance, a work commissioned at IRCAM in 1995. And I would like to thank you so much, Serge, for providing us with this excerpt. The duration of the excerpt is 2 minutes and 53 seconds.
We know today that this type of technology becomes obsolete rapidly. But were we aware of this years ago? How has the perception of obsolescence changed along the years and at IRCAM with respect to the preservation of these works? It is interesting to study this lifespan and how we think of the future of things produced today with technology. Because in the 20th century, so uh, in the beginning of IRCAM, this question of perennity, of uh, preserving what we are doing for the future was not really a question. There were a kind of optimism about uh, technology and people were thinking that as soon as you are using high technology and new technology, it will last forever. I remember very well when the CD came out, the commercial uh, advertisement and the idea around that is that we have a medium that we are supposed to preserve the music for eternity. And uh, now we know that it's not true. And for instance, I can find some CD, some uh, recordable CD recorded in the 80s or in the 90s that are not readable at all today. So it's, it was an illusion that with the technology, we can last forever. And it was a very a strong illusion. And after the beginning of the 21st century, we realized that we were building things on non-stable uh, uh, mediums. Well, speaking of instability, most platforms and tools for preservation aim to be future-proof, in quotes. What is your take on building a future-proof system? What do you base your decisions on when it comes to planning a strategy for the preservation of the works produced at IRCAM? It's a related topic to long-term preservation of uh, digital media. And there are some projects about trustfulness on digital repositories. And it involves a lot of uh, consideration, like financial consideration, like political and geopolitical consideration, because if we want to preserve some material for the, some digital information for the long term, you cannot count on institutions because institutions have a limited uh, lifetime. You cannot even count on states because war can happen. So it's, uh, these are really difficult subjects. The thing is that to preserve digital data, you need to give some energy. I mean, if you unplug the server or if you don't give uh, enough human resources, permanent human resources to preserve the, the repository, it will disappear, it will die. That's something we have also observed in, in this context, because since the beginning of the 21st century, there have been a lot of initiatives to preserve electroacoustic music, for instance, or, or interactive music, or music mixed. And a lot of these projects were financed for a certain amount of time. And after the end of the project, it disappears. So even on the internet, we can find a lot of repository, but as they are not maintained, they disappear. So I start to make a kind of uh, cemetery of uh, dead projects. And there are quite a lot. So now about your question, we are trying to think about what I call meta-preservation, which means that we want to preserve not only the content of what we want to preserve, but also the container. So we want to preserve the preservation project itself. And that's also something we have learned from uh, previous experiments. That you can give a lot of energy to a project, but if you don't think about the preservation of the project itself, it will disappear. And what you have done is done for nothing. <laughs> Even if we don't know what the future will bring, IRCAM is taking action to preserve its own productions. You do have a system in place that collects all the information about these productions. So we have an internal system we are using to system? preserve our repertoire, which is called CINE. And we are using this system at IRCAM Production since 2008. We are using it on a daily basis to document pieces and also to retrieve the information when we want to perform the piece or where someone outside of IRCAM wants to perform the IRCAM pieces. We are sending the information from the database. And how does Sydney work? It's a database with a um, web interface. So it's a website which is part of the BRAMS website 
which is a public database with information on contemporary music. But the Sydney part is a kind of hidden part of Brahms, which is only accessible inside Yakam. And what do we find if we look into Sydney? For each version of each piece, we can find three elements, very important elements. One is the list of material, hardware and software that were used for this precise performance. So it's important to know what are the technical material and software and, and uh, hardware that we used at this time for the performance. The other element are the files. So we are preserving using several uh, strategies, the files, so the software programs, max patches, sound files, a lot of different kind of files, and instructions, so text, a kind of instruction manual that tells the, the performer how to use the material and the software to play the piece. So it's just a written text with these instructions. Another important information is uh, the name of the people that produce this performance, like the sound engineer, the, the soloist, uh, computer music designers. Because even if we have all the information, like the files, the instructions, and the list of material, maybe sometime we want to speak with the people and ask them how it should sound. So it means that even if we are using high technology and computers and digital things, it's also important to find some witnesses of the of the event, because even if we are in high technology, uh, oral transmission, oral tradition is quite important. So the information of knowing who we are present to the performance is also uh, crucial. And an important thing also to say about our system is that we are not preserving the work as item, as an object, but every new version of the work. So preservation item is a version of the work, is an implementation of the work, and we are presenting all the successive reworking of each piece. So the idea is that the work is not uh, fixed, it's in constant evolution. So we want to have a system that is dynamic enough to allow this uh, incremental preservation. What is the oldest piece that we find in Sydney? So in the database that we are using to preserve uh, the production material for the Yakam pieces, we can order it by uh, creation date, production date, and the oldest piece in the Sydney database is a piece by uh, the late David Wessel, who was working at Yakam since the beginning, and it's a piece for tape produced with a computer, and it's a piece called Anthony. And it was produced on a 4A computer, which was uh, designed by Giuseppe Di Giugno, and it was a the first version of several real-time digital signal processing computers that will finally go to the 4X, which would be the kind of uh, fer de lance, uh, one of uh, important computers in uh, IRCAM history, and that was used for uh, Répond by Pierre Willis. So the 4A was used to produce the uh, uh, Anthony uh, tape. And we can listen to an excerpt of Anthony right now. I understand that the concept of the piece is that of a rich sound spectrum that slowly evolves over time. So in order to appreciate the piece better, we would have to listen to it in its entirety. We only have an excerpt about one minute long, but we can still get an idea of how it sounded. So here is an excerpt from David Wessel's Anthony, produced with the 4A digital processor at IRCAM in 1977.
This piece was produced with the 4A digital processor. Do you still have this? Do you keep this historical hardware? No, we don't even know where the 4A is. And the 4X is no more at Yakam. It's in, uh, in a museum now. So it's, uh, and it's not functional at all. But you mentioned that you keep the software and the sound files and the hardware. So what do we find in Sydney? No, in fact, in the database, we are keeping a list of the hardware that is used, but we are not preserving the hardware itself. What if you want to reperform a piece, for example, Anthony? Okay, it's a piece for tape. So if we want to reperform, we just have to play the tape. But if we want to reproduce it, we will need to use new systems. It's clearly not possible to reproduce it from scratch with the original computer because the original computer doesn't exist at all today. Aha, uh -huh. so maybe that's why there is a special focus on real-time systems. So you don't have a tape to store What will be performed actually needs to happen real time. So what do you do with the missing hardware there? Yeah, but it's not so clear than that because uh, sometimes we want to be able to reproduce even tape music. And it happens that, for instance, uh, a piece is by John Chowning from the same period, which has some uh, new implementation. So it's a tape piece like uh, David Wessel. But uh, it has been reproduced on a real-time version. So it, it exists as original tape, but it also exists as real-time piece. And uh, John Shoning has given his uh, blessing on the real-time version also. And it happens that there is also a more recent version of the Anthony tape by David Wessel, which was reworked by some young composers to produce a real-time version of the piece. So it means that it's not because it's a fixed media that we are not going to produce a real-time uh, version of it. And it's very important because it's related to uh, the fact that uh, all this repertoire, all this kind of music exists not only because it's stored, not only because it's played before an, an audience, but also because it has the possibility to be reworked, to be uh, reproduced, remixed by some other interpreters other performers. So um, we can find also a real-time version of uh, Anthony by David Wessel. And you never keep the hardware. It doesn't matter what piece it comes from. You just keep the software patches and documentation, but not the actual hardware. By choice, this is by designing your preservation strategy. Do I understand correctly? It's a good question, and I think it's, it's a choice. Because if we decide to preserve all the hardware, it means that we have to preserve really all the hardware and we don't have the resources for that. So as we cannot preserve all the hardware uh, extensively, it's not a subject. Each time we have to perform a piece with a obsolete hardware, instead of trying to make this hardware work or trying to emulate it, we are trying to virtualize it. So trying to describe the process or the sounds in a way that is abstract enough to be able to uh, reproduce it on several hardwares. And yes, it's a choice because we can also make the choice of emulating old hardware, but we have not decided to go in this direction. And it's a choice, yes. And do you ever keep the recording of how a piece sounded in your database? So when you try to rework a piece after a couple of years and you only have the materials, you can have a sense of how it sounded So is the recording of a possible output of a performance part of the documentation? Yes, it's an interesting question because in this performing art world, we can think that as long as we can have a, a memory of the performance in the form of a recording or a video of the performance, and we can say that we have preserved the event, we have preserved the, the object. And in the mixed music, like concert music with instruments and electroacoustic uh, specialized sound. It's not true at all, <laughs> in fact, because if we have only the recording of the event, it's impossible to reproduce it. So it's, it's, not, um, it's a naive way to think that if we have a recording of the event, you can reproduce it. It's not true at all. So, uh, in fact, even if we have a recording of the concert, it will not help us a lot 
to reproduce the work. It's like a kind of uh, memory of the event, but just to make a new version of the work, a recording is it's just something that can give us a, a faint idea of what it should be. A more important thing for us in our memory is to record the input in the computer and the output of the computer. Because if we have that, we can consider that the digital signal processing system or the software program that treats sounds is like a black box. And we have the input of the box and the output of the box, and we can try to replace this black box and compare the input and the output of the original event. I mean, sending the input to the, our new version and comparing the output of the new system with the output of the old system which has been recorded. And it's something that helps us better than having a recording of the whole event. How many works are documented in the IRCAM database? Can you give us a figure? At IRCAM, the repertoire of pieces created at IRCAM is around eight or 900 since 1977. And uh, in the database, we have preserved around uh, 600 pieces. And how much of this material is public or accessible online, if at all? I think that at IRCAM we want to be able to give everything that has been produced at IRCAM to everybody, but it's not possible for legal reasons, because into this database we have a lot of different files, like published scores, like uh, recording from uh, musicians that didn't give the right to distribute the recording. So there are a lot of different elements which depends on different kind of property rights. So it means that we are only able to use it internally as long as we don't have cleared all the rights of all the files in the database, which is really difficult because there are a lot of different files from different origins and we don't have the rights on all the files. There can be also some... Uh, commercial softwares or and it's something that we can use only internally and we cannot distribute it to, to everybody. And the most performed, the most played name in the IRCAM database is Pierre Boulez. Pierre Boulez. Yeah, um, amongst all the composers that has been commissioned work at IRCAM, we can find Pierre Boulez, but it's it's not the most uh, important composer in the database to composers like the others, but uh, his pieces like Répond or En Thème 2 or Explosant Fix are played very often uh, in the whole world. Uh, so it's, uh, this music has a lot of diffusion, but it's just uh, a composer as others in, in the Sydney database. When Boulez was director of your cam, Was he aware of the issue of preservation? Was he sensitive to this topic? No, I don't think so. He was not a guy from uh, archives and he was more uh, someone thinking about the future. So at this time, they have some idea about progress, art evolution, and he was more someone thinking about the future than thinking about the past. He was composer in, in, into a, a kind of tradition, but he was also of the generation of a kind of tabula rasa. He was not really interested so much in the past. But now, if we want to play his music, we need to preserve his, uh, his patrimony, his memory. So he wouldn't even be obsessed over the preservation of his own production? I don't think so. It's like I said before, like it, it was a composer that writes very precise score. So if you write a very precise score, it's that because you want to transmit your music to musicians, so to transmit your music in space and also in time, you want the music that you have written on paper to, to stay in time. But he was not concerned about the preservation of the electroacoustic part at all. If we keep digging into this database, what other interesting example can we find that we can listen to now? Uh, for instance, we have uh, listened to the oldest piece in the database, and I can find in the database a piece that has a lot of different technological re-implementations. For instance, Jupiter by Philippe Manori, which the first version was also for the 4X, But after that, there is a version for ISPW, which was the next computer with uh, specially designed boards. 
uh, which was the IRCAM Signal Processing Workstation, which is also uh, an old system which is not functional anymore. And after that, there was a version for C code graphics computer and then a version for Max MSP. So there are a lot of different re-implementation of the same music. And in our Cine database, we can compare these different software implementation of the same uh, works. And of all the re-implementations, which one are we going to listen to now? I have a version for 2004 that used the ISPW. Thank you for sharing this with us. We are going to listen to an excerpt of Philippe Manouri's Jupiter, the duration of the excerpt is two minutes. I think it's pretty clear by now how archiving is a collaborative effort. The composer, the sound designer, maybe a performer, they all can contribute to the documentation of a piece. But the other half of the name of the working group that you're a member of, that we mentioned earlier, the working group of AFIM, is collaborative archiving and creative preservation. So how is preservation creative? Okay, what I uh, also I, I mentioned that is that we realize at the end that a work of art using new technology, and if we compare it to a work of art not using new technology like uh, painting or a sculpture, the object we want to preserve in an archive it's really the object, like the painting, the sculpture in the best conditions. But we cannot do that for a work of art, including technological means, so techno-culture. Uh, we cannot preserve the work of art in the techno-cultural world in the same way, because if we keep the file like something fixed, it will not be readable or performable after a few years. So it's, it's a big challenge, because we want to build a culture, and to build a culture, we want to preserve the work of art. But we cannot preserve them because if we preserve it as closed objects, it's, it's dead. So the only way to make it live is to reperform it always and to be able to always reinterpret. So it's a challenge, but it's also a chance because to make it a living, it, we have to constantly reinterpret it. So that's the creative part. And at the end, we realize that it's really common nowadays to even re reinterpret even music that is on fixed media, like a tape, like Anthony by David Wessel or, or a piece by John Schoening, which we can think of as a fixed media because it's, it's a sound file. But even that, we want to re-perform it to make it live. So it's, it's also a change. And that's what, why I, we call it creative. It's because the fact to archive it, I mean, archiving this kind of uh, 
uh, work of art is not the right word. It's, uh, it means that to preserve it, you need to re-perform it and, and to reinterpret it constantly. If I understand this concept correctly, in order to keep the musical repertoire alive, it is not just necessary to document it, but it's also necessary to keep playing it. That is, active playing the music becomes an active strategy for its preservation. Yes, that's exactly what I said. It's that uh, the, the only way to make it live is to, to play it, in fact. <laughs> so, uh... As of today, it is really fair to say that IRCAM really cares about the preservation of its own repertoire. And by developing tools and methodologies and sharing them, IRCAM can also really help other institutions follow the example to the benefit of music repertoire produced everywhere, not just at IRCAM. Can you talk a little bit about how this machine works? How many people are involved? Is there a preservation team? How many resources are devoted to this? So how much energy goes into this activity of IRCAM? Yes, one of the missions, one of the main missions of IRCAM is to make some new creations with technology, some musical creation using new technology. That's one of the main goal at IRCAM. So each year, we commission some composers to, to make some creations since 1977 until today. So we have each year some commissions to composers. And the mission is to, to make some new creations. But we also want to be able to re-perform the piece because music, it's not only a kind of ephemeral art. It's the, important, the important thing is the concert when the music is live and the audience is listening to the music. But it's also culture, so we want to be able to replay the pieces we have played. It's not a, a one shot. So at the beginning of IACAM, it was a time of pioneers and we were making new creations. So the question of repertoire was not a question. We want to create some new musics. But after a few years, it becomes a kind of repertoire and we want to be able to replay all the pieces that have been created at IACAM. And we are involved into this preservation and also towards the composers because a, a, a classical composer, we write a score for a string quartet or piano. We will always be able to read the music and to find some musicians to play the piece. But if we ask the composer to use a computer or a specially designed uh, device, we want the piece to be able to be re-performed after some time has, has gone. So um, that's the reason why we want to preserve the piece. It's not for the future, but really to be able to, to make the music present in concert, even if it has been composed uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So to answer your question, there is a department for preserving what has been produced at IACAM, but our goal is really to be able to re-perform. So it's a short-term preservation, and it's really to keep the music alive. Uh, so it's not really an archive, and there is no department for that except the production department, which is the department that consists in production managers and uh, sound engineers and computer music designers. And our main goal is to, to produce concerts. So we want to be able to, to replay the piece from the past. I would like to challenge you with the last question a little bit. It's a $1 million question, like every question around culture and around reflections on culture and our techno-culture, precisely. Thank you for using the word earlier on in the interview. That's what it all boils down to today. So... The efforts put in place by IRCOM to preserve this type of repertoire, which is always considered a niche, how is it of importance for society at large? Or how is it important for people who are not directly engaged and involved with electroacoustic music? So how does this preservation effort fit and contribute to the big picture of cultural heritage today? Yes, uh, we can think of music as something 
ephemeris, something that is an event that happens only once, and it's true because that's the nature of music is something that is immaterial and that that doesn't last longer than, than the event and the concert. But we are in, in, a, in a certain tradition, a musical tradition, that lives with a certain historical conscience. So uh, even the composers, sometimes they think only of the moment of the composition and of the creation, and they don't think about their own future, about the future of their works, what, what will happen of their music after they disappeared of this world. But it's also an illusion, because if you are writing a score, or if you are writing a computer program in an artistic context, it's because you want what you are producing to live longer than yourself. So that's a, that's a reason, in fact. So it's really a, a question of culture and, and civilization, yes. What a beautiful note to close on. Preservation as an act of civilization. Thank you so much, Serge, for receiving me here at IRCAM today and for sharing with us so much of your knowledge and so much of the music. I would like to close this episode with another excerpt by Fausto Romitelli. The excerpt comes from a piece called Natura Morta con Fiamme and the duration is about two minutes. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. <laughs>